I think we'll go ahead and get started. Everyone, welcome. The Federalist Society is founded on three principles, that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and the duty of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what, not what the law should be. Can anyone else in the room tell me what case that's from? <coughs> Marbury versus Madison, lovely. The University of Houston's chapter of the Federalist Society is one of over 300 chapters across the nation. Our membership is composed of law students, faculty, lawyers, and public policy experts who place a premium on individual liberty, our structural constitution, and the rule of law. So how do we do that? Well, we host debates. We bring in some of the nation's top legal minds to debate key constitutional law issues. And of course, we provide lunch. Which brings us to today's event. My first announcement is that our lunch will be provided by Chick-fil-A. But I wanted to note that by serving Chick-fil-A today, we are not making any kind of statement about <laughs> the groups Chick-fil-A may or may not choose to support with their private business contributions. And that would be on behalf of the Federalist Society and, of course, on behalf of Outlaw. The Federalist Society is not a political organization. We do not tote um, the what the law, again, should be. We just like to discuss how that law should be crafted. Are these issues uh, apt for a constitutional referendum? Are they states' rights issues? And so forth. So, my second announcement is one that's very exciting to make. I get to introduce our nationally renowned speakers. Today, we're honored to have two excellent speakers who are very uh, well adept to debate this issue. And it's very timely. Today, we'll be debating the definition of marriage. And at noon, the Ninth Circuit will announce whether California's same-sex marriage ban, also known as Proposition 8, violates the constitutional rights of gays and lesbians. So we are going to have the two speakers present the first part of their, um, I suppose, presentation. And after they have their first round, so to speak, we usually just have rebuttal and questions, but we're going to actually announce the decision um, from the Ninth Circuit, how it went either way, and then the speakers will have an opportunity to address that actual case, the merits of that case, and maybe what they think is viable on, on cert, which indeed either side, uh, whoever is a loser will, I'm sure, um, want to have that heard by the Supreme Court. So, moving along, our first speaker will be Dr. Jennifer Roback Morse. Dr. Morse is the founder and president of the Ruth Institute. The Ruth Institute conducts academic studies on marriage on college campuses in an effort to foster an intellectual and social climate favorable to marriage. Dr. Morse served as research fellow at Stanford University for eight years. She taught economics at Yale University and at George Mason University for 15 years and she is a senior research fellow in economics at the Axton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. Dr. Morse's scholarly articles have appeared in political science journals and law reviews, such as the Journal of Economic History, the Journal of Federalism, the University of Chicago Law Review, the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, and many more. Her public policy articles have also been published in Forbes, Fortune Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, and others. She's also written two books. Mr. Mitchell Kateen is a founding partner at Houston's Kateen and Neckman, famously, and he's famously served as local counsel in Lawrence v. Texas. We all studied Lawrence v. Texas in our constitutional law classes, and those of you who are 1Ls can look forward to it. This is the case in which the Supreme Court held as unconstitutional all sodomy statutes in the country. Mr. Kateen received his JD from South Texas College of Law here in Houston. He's an adjunct at both South Texas and here at U of H, and teaches a, a course on HIV and the law. Mr. Kateen has helped create numerous GLBT legal organizations in Houston and Texas. He regularly appears on local and national TV and radio programs debating same-sex marriage, gay and lesbian adoption, HIV AIDS, and civil rights. Mr. Kateen has received numerous advocacy awards. It would take literally five minutes to read them off. From the State Bar of Texas, from the Houston Bar Association, to name a few um, of the sources of these awards, 
Texas Monthly Magazine has listed him as a super lawyer for three years in a row. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer Roback Morse. Now, we've been back and forth a little bit about ground rules, so let me just clarify that um, we each get 12 minutes opening statement. Do I have a timekeeper? I have a clock back here, but do I have anybody with an obnoxious sign or anything? Okay, all right, great. Um, yes, <clears throat> before I begin discussing the issue before us today of the definition of marriage to remove the gender requirement for marriage, I would like to remind you of a previous episode of law which changed the definition of marriage or by changing one of the fundamental parameters of the marriage institution. And that is something that removed the presumption of permanence from marriage as a social institution. Uh, and I'm referring, of course, to no fault the institution of no-fault divorce. In 1968, the state of California removed the presumption of per permanence by basically saying that uh, the law would no longer hold that, uh, that marriage was presumptively a permanent uh, union, uh, with, with, uh, which could only be exited for cause. Um, marital fault became a non-issue, and um, the idea that you had to have a reason for getting a divorce went out the window legally. Now, at that time, the reason I want to bring this up is because at that time, it was uh, presented to us as a mild uh, innovation in existing law that would only affect a handful of people. It was presented as something that would simply lower the cost of divorce to people who had already made up their minds to get divorced in the first place. And oh, by the way, we have some studies that show that divorce will not be harmful to children. In fact, we believe that children will be fine as long as their parents are happy. Um, and so what, the reason to point this out is that it, those rosy predictions proved to be false in every particular. That is to say that divorce, uh, no, the, removing the fault basis from divorce had far-reaching effects that went far beyond anything that anybody predicted at the time. And it turned out to affect everybody, really to put incentives into place that affected lot, large, large numbers of people. <coughs> and moreover, we found that the, those handful of studies that we have turned out not to really be conclusive, that we now have a lot of evidence that divorce is quite traumatic for children and quite difficult for children, and many of you may perhaps have personal experience in this regard. So I put that out there as a, as a, as a kind of cautionary tale uh, about the redefinition of the fundamental parameters of marriage, because that's really what we're talking about. So I'd like to begin, I always like to begin the discussion of this issue by asking ourselves what is the essential public purpose of marriage? That is, why do we have the institution of marriage in the first place? And I'm not an attorney, as you can tell from my bio. I'm more of a social science person. And so I look at this situation as, a, as sort of an institutional, social institutional question. Why do we have marriage in the first place? What is the essential public purpose of marriage? Well, I would say to you that the essential public purpose of marriage is to attach mothers and fathers to their children and to one another. The essential public purpose of marriage is to attach mothers and fathers to their children and to one another. It's an essential purpose in the sense that if you didn't need to get that job done, you probably wouldn't have an institution of marriage in the first place. That is to say, if human beings came into existence uh, either through some uh, kind of procreative process that didn't involve a man and a woman, uh, or if human beings came into existence uh, as uh, already grown up creatures that were already take care of themselves and just kind of uh, slither away from their parents as baby snakes do, you know, you, you wouldn't have ever thought of having an institution of lifelong sexual mo monogamy, you know, that just wouldn't have entered people's minds. And so I say it's an essential purpose in exactly that sense, that without that purpose, you wouldn't have needed the institution of marriage in the first place. It is a public purpose as opposed to a private purpose because this is a public purpose to attach children to their mothers and fathers because when you say these people are the parents of the child, you're also saying no one else is. Right? You're excluding all the other possible people who might show up and say, I'm the grandma, I get to decide what's going to happen, and so on. Okay? So it's, a pub it's an intrinsically public purpose. It cannot be privatized. And it's also in contrast to all the many private purposes that individuals might have uh, in choosing to get married or not to get married. So when you choose to get married, usually you're not thinking a bit th about this big public purpose. You're thinking, you know, gee, I want the pretty dress or I want the health benefits or I want my mom to be happier with me that I'm not shacked up with the guy anymore or, you know, whatever your reason might be. And there can be lots and lots of private reasons why people would choose to get married or not. But all of those private reasons I submit to you do not add up to a single public reason to why you would have the institution of marriage in the first place. 
And that is really the distinction I'd like you to keep in mind. The public purpose of marriage is something different from all of the different private purposes that people commonly give for wanting to get married. So um, now I want to just say uh, briefly how it is that the institution of marriage is an institutional structure. Uh, connects children with their parents, how this works. Now, it's usually pretty easy to do the mom side of things. Okay, when a, when a baby is born, there's usually a mother somewhere close by. And so uh, people usually pretty, pretty well figure out who the mother is and, uh, and that she's entitled. She's ordinarily entitled to be the one and only mother of the child and to, and to be, be presumptively that, that she is the mother. Uh, the problem always is to figure out who's the daddy. Okay, where's the daddy? The daddy can be on the other side of the moon. The daddy can be dead. Um, the daddy doesn't have to be anywhere around. The way marriage works is to say that a married woman's husband is presumed to be the father of any children that she gives birth to. The married woman's husband is presumed to be the father of any children that she gives birth to. And so if you combine that legal rule with a social practice and presumption of sexual exclusivity, you pretty much are attaching kids to their biological parents through this system. That's what marriage does. That's how it works. And so that presumption of paternity, what is happening to us is that presumption of paternity, that's what that is called, um, is changing through a kind of sleight of hand from the presumption of paternity to a gender neutral presumption of parentage, okay? which I'm going to argue in a moment is something quite different. But in the meantime, what I want us to do is to give you the alternative understanding of the purpose of marriage. Okay? And I'm going to quote uh, <coughs> Judge Von Walker, uh, who we will be hearing from indirectly later today, because it's his ruling that I'm going to quote this from. All right? um, in, the, in his ruling, uh, uh, overturning Proposition 8, uh, Judge Von Walker offered the following uh, um, understanding of Proposition 8. Here's what, or, sorry, not of Proposition 8. He offered the following understanding of the institution of marriage. Here's what Judge Walker had to say, and I quote, marriage is the state recognition and approval of a couple's choice to live with each other, to remain committed to one another, and to form a household based on their own feelings about one another, and to join in an economic partnership and support one another in any dependence, close quote. Now what I want you to notice about that definition is that there's nothing there really about children as the purpose of marriage. There's nothing there about this being a sexual union. Some of you guys could count as married to your roommates under this definition if you wanted to count as married uh, uh, under this definition. So what has been done in this definition or understanding, it's not even quite a definition, but uh, in this understanding of marriage, um, the, the purpose that I have mentioned of attaching children to their parents is not even part of the definition. It's not just moved down the list of in, in relative importance. It's taken off the list of purposes, of possible purpose, public purposes of marriage. And why is that? Because the definition which I offered you, or the purpose, the purpose that I mentioned to you, is something where I think it is pretty clear that same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples are situated differently with respect to that purpose. Right? So if the purpose is to attach mothers and fathers to their children and to one another, it's pretty clear that a same-sex couple and an opposite-sex couple is situated differently with respect to that, uh, to, to that purpose. And it would make sense, actually, to have somewhat different legal institutions to do the jobs that you're trying to get done if that's, in fact, part of the purpose of marriage. So that kind of purpose had to be removed from Judge Walker's understanding of the purpose of marriage so that he could declare, in effect, marriage to be a gender-neutral institution. And so, in effect, we could declare parenthood to be a gender-neutral concept. So let me now explain how it is, I believe, that redefining marriage is actually going to undermine some key principles of law and social practice that I think will affect everyone, not simply uh, the handful of people who currently define themselves as gay and lesbian and who might get married or might choose to get married or whatever. There are other persons who are going to be affected because you're putting incentives into place that are going to turn out to affect everybody. The incentives are there for everyone, not just for people who are gay and lesbian. So um, here, here, is, uh, <clears throat> here are the principles that I think we currently operate on more or less um, that I, th I believe will be undermined by the redefinition of marriage. The first is that children are ordinarily entitled to a relationship with both of their parents. The children are ordinarily entitled to a relationship with both of their parents. That is to say, we, if you're going to deprive kids of a relationship with their parents, you need to have a reason. 
you need to have a reason. It's not something that you just do kind of willy-nilly. And the kids are entitled to that means, in effect, that, um, that, that it's an entitlement that has to be protected proactively. That is to say, children have some kind of interest, legitimate interest, in the stability of their parents' union because the stability of their parents' union is part of what makes it possible for them to be in relationship with both of their parents. And it's because of that that the government has ever had any kind of interest in, uh, in the thing that we now are calling marriage. Children can't protect those rights themselves. <laughs> and trying to protect those rights after the fact, if the rights have been violated, a five-year-old marches into court and says, see here, you know, I don't get to see my dad except once a year. Someone get over here and do something about it. You know, it's way too late. Uh, to, to, to take corrective action that would protect the child's uh, legitimate interests. And so you have to act proactively, not after the fact, and marriage is an institutional structure that addresses that problem, that addresses that need. And so now we, we, we will be saying that kids do not presumptively deserve and are entitled to a relationship with both of their biological parents. That is part of what is going to be at stake. Secondly, we have the idea that mothers and fathers are not interchangeable as parents. Um, that is, that mothers bring something to the table, that fathers bring something to the table, and that, that and parenthood itself is more than simply a list of functions um, that have to get done by somebody, male or female, that there is something to the human body that is important and really irreducible. Uh, thirdly, we have the idea, the current law and social practice, that biology is the default and normal way that we figure out who counts as a parent. Um, that the default mode is that parenthood means biology. Now, as I mentioned before, the presumption of paternity is as part of how we're trying to do that. We're trying to attach kids to their uh, biological mothers and fathers. And what is happening in, uh, in the whole series of cases that, that are disputed lesbian custody cases that are coming before the courts, uh, they're trying to argue uh, that the presumption of paternity should be just sort of morphed into a presumption of parentage, which is a gender neutral concept. Okay. Now, you can see that that concept can never be uh, the, t the, the child's two biological parents. Okay, so the, the lesbian partner, the same-sex sexual partner, is never the child's other biological parent. The child's other biological parent typically has been escorted off the stage before anything ever happens through uh, the institution of anonymous sperm donation. He's off the stage. And um, this other person, who is not the child's mother by biology, and who is not the child's mother by adoption, um, is coming before the court saying, I would like to be a parent, I would like the rights and benefits of parenthood, even though I am not a biological or adoptive parent. Let us call that person a non-parent. Non-parents are asking for parental rights. If you do an adoption, you're a parent, and these <coughs> cases don't come up in situations where an adoption has been performed, right? There is no dispute then, okay? So adoption isn't really an exception. We can talk about that if you want to. And then finally, the final point is that this, this, we currently have the idea that biology is a natural pre-existing reality which the state simply records. The states, basically what the state does is that these are the two parents who are just writing down who mom and dad are. But the state does not presume to say, to define, or to determine who is the parent when there are when absent DNA testing. You know, the parent, the state is not presuming to do that. And so what we have here is this, is replacing a natural pre-political reality with something that is politically created by the state for the state's purposes. And I say that marriage is something that belongs to the people and something that is created prior to the state and that the state has no right to interfere with. Thank you very much. Is that my time? Thank you. Okay. <coughs> now, the decisions come down from the Ninth Circuit. Would you rather I read it no, the now wait, or wait? It's, it's very exciting. Right? I think, yeah, I think you should, I think he should have the chance to do his yeah, thing. Yeah, because I'll be responding to that. Sure. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Right. His time. Right. Thank you. I just didn't know if Dr. Yeah. Roback Morsh, either of you could stand it to I me can, longer. I can stand it. Um, <laughs> we've, stood, we've stood it many months. We can't stand it a little longer. Okay, and I'll be in the back there with my. All right, just let me know. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for uh, being patient. I think uh, uh, Dr. Morris and I uh, mentioned that no matter what the decision is, this isn't the final decision in this case. And so it will be interesting to see, but uh, ultimately the Supreme Court will make 
the uh, final decision on uh, marriage equality. I'm really glad to be here today. Uh, this is a this is a topic that I never expected would really be uh, would really be relevant in my life. When I graduated from law school in 1985, being allowed to marry my same-sex partner was very far from my thinking. For most gay people never imagined that they would have the right to actually legally marry their partner. But in fact, our society, our laws have moved very quickly. I, uh, I want to share with you just a little bit of personal information. My partner and I have two adopted children. And uh, we are both the legal parents for our children. They don't look like this anymore. They're now nine years old. And in driving them to school this morning, I asked them, I told them what I was doing today. And I said, what do you think marriage is? They know that daddy and poppy are not allowed to get married in Texas. And they know they're allowed to get married in other states. And my son said, uh, marriage makes you proud to be a family. Uh, my daughter said, marriage makes a family permanent. Now, we were on our way to school, so we didn't have an opportunity to discuss that uh, in any great detail. But if that's what marriage makes, and their family is not allowed to get married, there's something in there that we're going to need to talk about. Because marriage would make our, them proud to have his family and to make it permanent. And so there are some issues there that we need to talk about. Um, this country was founded, and there's a handout, if, uh, just, just that I'm going to go along because I'm going to talk about some cases. Um, this country was founded on the principles of freedom and liberty from government intrusion into our private lives. The United States Constitution, which is not very long or uh, complicated, well, it may be complicated, but it's not very long, you can get a copy of it right outside. This is it. This is the United States Constitution. It is, it is a wonderful document. Um, in the Constitution, there are two amendments I want to bring to your attention. The first one is the First Amendment, which talks about uh, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The reason I wanted to start with that, I had not met Dr. Morse before, but having talked about marriage many times before, religion is usually a main argument for opponents of same-sex marriage. I did not hear that this morning, so I will not uh, give you all of my response yet to that, but, but it usually is. And so I want to begin my talk by explaining the difference between religious marriage ceremonies and civil marriage. I think most of you know that there's over a thousand rights that our government provides to people who get married that my partner and I are not allowed to have because we're not allowed to get married in Texas. In fact, in the federal system, all of the marriages in all of the states, which we'll be talking about in a moment, are not recognized federally yet, so they don't get the federal benefits of marriage. Please understand that those of us that are, that are advocates for marriage equality are not trying to, to force uh, the civil rights of marriage on any religious institutions. Right now, there are some religious institutions that will not allow people who are divorced to get married or people of different faiths to get married, and they have a right to do that under the Freedom of Religion Clause of the Constitution. Number two is the 14th Amendment, and the 14th Amendment provides for the right to life, liberty, and property cannot be deprived without due process, or the, uh, cannot deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. Those are the two provisions of the Constitution in which, in which the right to marriage equality is based. So I wanted to start with that. In 1967, there was a couple that got married. They fell in love. They got married. They had children. I just saw the video on it uh, uh, this weekend. And that was uh, Mr. and Ms. Loving, who got married in Virginia. F for them, uh, they fell in love, they got married, they happened to be of different races. At that time, there were 17 states that made interracial marriage a crime. They were convicted of violating that criminal statute in Virginia, and the basis for it, for that statute, as the judge cited, was God and the Bible, that God did not want the races to mix. They had placed them on separate continents, 
and but for the interference of men, there would not be these abominations, these marriages. If you study what happened in the Loving case and what is being said about gay and lesbian people having the right to marriage, you will see, you will see parallels. You will see very similar arguments regarding, regarding God. And, and of course, the Bible, this is the argument, of course, the Bible doesn't permit same-sex people to enter these relationships. It was the same argument that the United States Supreme Court in its decision said was, um, was erroneous. And in their unanimous decision, they said the freedom to marry has long been recognized as one of the vital personal rights essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness by free men. This is in the loving decision. Marriage is one of the basic civil rights of men, fundamental to our very existence and survival. The 14th Amendment requires that the freedom of choice to marry not be restricted by invidious racial discrimination. Under our Constitution, the freedom to marry or not marry, remember, we're not advocating that everybody has to get married, a person of another, st another race resides with the individual and cannot be infringed by the state. Okay? I propose to you that the loving decision will be at the heart, in addition to the Lawrence decision, those two decisions together will result in the Supreme Court declaring throughout this country that, that uh, gender and male and female sex will not be a prohibition to marriage. In 1986, you had the Bowers v. Hardwick case. I'm now going to get into the, the argument of morality. Because in 1986, the Supreme Court said that the Georgia statute that made oral sex a crime was constitutional and, and uh, that gay and lesbian people were not protected for, in the right to privacy based upon morality. That, that the sentiments about the morality of homo homosexuality was adequate to uphold the law. And we dealt with the Bowers v. Hardwick decision for 15 years. And children were denied uh, custody of their parents because of this. Uh, people were kicked out of jobs. <coughs> Bowers v. Hardwick was a terrible, terrible decision. Fast forward to 1998, when John Lawrence and Tyrone Gardner, I, I would like three minute warning, please, okay? Uh, when John Lawrence and Tyrone Gardner were arrested here in Texas for having sex in John Lawrence's home. Uh, Texas, along with 13 other states, had laws prohibiting um, sexual intimacies between people of the same sex. They were arrested and taken to jail in the middle of the night. The only charge was homosexual conduct. Um, we lost at every step of the way. I had the privilege of representing them as their local counsel, Lambda Legal, and other constitutional scholars from around the country uh, were the lead attorneys. And we lost at every level in Texas. And I remember the day that um, we got notice that the Supreme Court was demanding that the district attorney file a response. That was the first inclination that we were headed to Washington, D.C. During oral arguments, and I was there sitting, sitting with John Lawrence, during oral arguments, uh, Justice Breyer asked this Harris County district attorney, what's the harm if we allow this law to stand? Who's going to be hurt? And Justice Scalia suggested, aren't there medical reasons? Isn't homosexuality a lot of disease and all that? And the district attorney said, no, that's not part of our argument. And that same question, because the answer was nobody would be hurt, it's a matter of morality. And under Bowers v. Hardwick, just because we think it's immoral is sufficient to have this law. Ladies and gentlemen, that same argument is involved here. Now, my co-debater has an argument that, that allowing same-sex marriage hurts children. I'm gonna, before I finish, I'm going to show you that, based upon scholars, that, that that's not true. But you still have the, the, broader, the broader question. Whenever, whenever you're hearing about same-sex marriage, you have the question of, who cares? Who's it going to hurt if if me and my partner can get married in our home, how is that going to hurt 
You, if you're heterosexual, you and your spouse. And I would propose to you that it won't. That it won't. In fact, under our Constitution, we allow adults who are, are consenting with one another to engage in these type of important fundamental rights. Remember, gay and lesbian people are not trying to change marriage. We're trying to join marriage. We acknowledge it is one of the most important institutions of our society. And we are being deprived of that simply because some people think that what we do and our love for one another is immoral. The Supreme Court in the Lawrence decision said morality alone is not sufficient to deprive people in, to, to have a criminal statute, and I would say when it gets there, to deprive people from this fundamental right of marriage. I only have a couple minutes left. I have a few more things in my opening. I want to just share with you Justice Scalia, in his dissenting opinion in the Lawrence decision, says, if morality isn't there, what other justification could there possibly be for denying the benefits of marriage to homosexual, homosexual couples exercising the liberty protected by the Constitution? Ladies and gentlemen, Justice Scalia was right. We, as the proponents for John Lawrence and Tyrone Gardner, did not argue marriage at the Supreme Court. He brought it up and he said, if morality alone is not sufficient to maintain this criminal statute, then it won't be sufficient to deny homosexuals the right to marry. In case you want a few statistics on the last page, I've given you the, the uh, seven states and the District of Columbia that marriage is permitted between same-sex people. In other words, we're arguing about should there be marriage, there is already same-sex marriage in this country. There are 27 countries that permit same-sex marriage or a form or a part of same-sex marriage. The United States is not yet on that list. I want to, I want to close uh, by telling you uh, two things. First, the American Academy of Pediatrics has issued reports that say a growing body of scientific literature demonstrates that children who grow up with one or two gay or lesbian parents fare as well in emotional, cognitive, social, and sexual functioning as do children whose parents are heterosexual. Children's optimal development seems to be influenced more by the nature of the relationships and interactions within the family unit than by the particular structural form it takes. The last thing I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is that I believe in my lifetime, when my children are adults, we will see same-sex marriage permitted here. And I guess at that point, uh, my son will be able to be proud of his family, and my daughter will feel like her family is permanent. Thank you very much. What an honor to have you both. Thank you very much. So now I'll just announce the decision, and then how many minutes did we have to have comments on maybe the what you think about that. It depends on how long your, it takes you to make the decision. I'll just, well, <laughs> yeah. without further ado, California gay marriage ban is unconstitutional. In a 133 page decision, which is printing, printing for you both um, for the past five Thank minutes. You. Um, it's probably jammed a number of copiers in the school. Um, a federal uh, appeals court today declared California's same-sex marriage ban to be unconstitutional, putting the bitterly contested voter-approved law on track for likely consideration in front of the Supreme Court. This is from Associated Press, uh, off the above the law legal blog. A uh, three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit uh, ruled two to one that a lower court judge correctly interpreted the U.S. Constitution and Supreme Court precedents when he declared in 2010 that Prop 8 was a violation of the civil rights of gays and lesbians. And we've, we're printing the decision. One thing we did notice, though, was the case they, case they cited to was Roper, which is a Roman. Kennedy, uh, Romer, excuse me, right, uh, which was a Kennedy decision, I think. Uh, they all anticipated the appeal. Uh, so... There we have it, and I think we'll have uh, Dr. Morse. And, and how long would you like each of us to take at this point? Because we want to have Q&A. So I say yeah. three minutes each, three? and then we'll have Q&A. <laughs> and then the students will have to just ask about it. if they Maybe how four. How about five, and then we'll be at a quarter till, yeah. and we'll have 15 yeah. minutes for yeah. Q&A? Yeah. Well, technically, we have to be out at a quarter till. We have That's to be out at a quarter till? We can all stay a couple minutes later, but...
you know. All right, well, let me get on with it. <laughs> In that case, let, let's let her rip. Well, first of all, let the record show that the first mention of religion today came from my opponent, OK? Um, and um, second of all, I want to just point out the, both the Loving case and the Skinner case in effect, if you look at them closely, support the procreative meaning of the institution of marriage. Because after all, the statute in question for the, for the Lovings was a miscegenation statute, meaning that the court and the country and the lawmakers, and everything, they knew perfectly well that Mr. and Mrs. Loving could participate in the procreative purpose of marriage. That's what they were worried about. Okay, And so there, there is a presumption in that case, and also you can find it in Skinner as well, um, that what marriage means is not just the right to randomly move in with somebody, but the right to participate in the procreative aspect of it. What was at stake in the Skinner case was uh, Mr. Skinner being involuntarily vasectomized. And the court believed, I think correctly, uh, and the reason he was going to be vasectomized is because he had three counts of misdemeanors, and this was a eugenic statute. It was thought that, uh, that uh, uh, this was a, he was a habitual chicken thief, and so therefore he should not be allowed to procreate. And the court held that, uh, that, um, that, this, that if he would essentially be damaged goods in the marriage market if he couldn't procreate. That's where that fundamental right to marry comes from um, in, that, in that case. So uh, that, those are important points. This, the second thing, the, the next thing, is is that we heard a little bit about freedom of religion, and I want to draw an important distinction here. Um, and that is that it's perfectly true that religious bodies are not going to be required to perform marriage ceremonies. That's perfectly true. No one disputes that. The issue is, however, that religious bodies uh, define their view of religious freedom as being quite a bit more extensive than that. In fact, every area where a religious body comes into contact with the public will be subjected to regulations of various kinds in order to make sure that they conform with the idea that marriage is to be a gender neutral institution. So far, we know that this can potentially include things like uh, adoption agencies, the employment benefits that they offer to their employees, um, and p potentially things that are, uh, that are potentially at stake in future cases would include things like the content of your marriage preparation programs and, um, and, and what you teach in preschool and all kinds of things that are currently nobody's business uh, uh, will amount to being uh, uh, the, the subject of, of regulation by the state. Finally, I would just like to go back to the basic point that I brought up, that as far as I'm concerned, these issues are about marriage and what marriage is, and what is the purpose of marriage, and what is the point of marriage. It's not, to me, fundamentally about the rights of gays and lesbians, or what gays and lesbians do or don't do, or whether it's what, you know, that is not the point. The point isn't what we think about gay people. The point is what we think about marriage. What is the point of marriage? And I, uh, my opponent actually said it, that he thinks marriage should be a gender neutral institution, that gender should not be a factor in marriage. And I think that that is a step too far. I think that is a fundamental redefinition of what marriage is about and what it can and cannot do as a social institution. And I would just like all of you to reflect, as students, as young people, to reflect. If you are, if you are behind the Rawlsian veil of ignorance, how many of you studied Jack Rawls in any of your class? You know what I'm talking about? If you don't know what I'm talking about, well, then never mind. This is, this, this is not going to work. This ain't going to fly. But would you like to come into the world in a world where it was presumed that children would be born to their mothers and fathers, their biological parents, or where it was presumed that uh, parenthood was whatever the government said parenthood was. Which kind of world would you like to be born into? That is part of what's at stake in this debate. And I believe that history is on my side because I believe that we're at war with our bodies and with nature itself. And I believe in the end we will prevail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just, I'm just going to take a moment so we can invite your questions. Um, I don't think that procreation has ever been a requirement for marriage. There are many, many heterosexual married people who never have children, many who cannot have children. And we do not make, we do not make uh, being able to bear children a requirement for marriage. There are many elderly people who, I mean, we can go on and on. There are over 65,000 children who have been adopted by gay and lesbian families. You know, when we, were, when we were arguing the Lawrence case, a now famous, I guess he was famous then, Senator Rick Santorum and President Bush uh, claimed that if we were successful, the sky would fall, that this would be the end of the civilization as we knew it. Then the Lawrence decision came out, and it was 
you've never read it, you should read it. It's a glorious decision. And that fear went away. The terrible things that they said were going to happen never happened. I understand the fear of, of people who, who grew up in a traditional family wondering, you know, what, what is this going to be like? What is this going to look like? And that's why it's so important. What is happening right now with these states permitting same-sex marriage, legalizing it, is, is what's supposed to be happening. That is the prelude to the Supreme Court decision because the Supreme Court likes for it to be in the states for a while. I want to just comment real briefly. I'm really thrilled about this decision. I was worried it was not going to come down that way. And as, uh, as we both uh, mentioned, it is just the next stepping stone. Uh, so this case will go to the Supreme Court. Uh, it may be time with the states, enough states having already adopted it, it will take maybe a year or two before it gets to the Supreme Court. Um, and I believe uh, just like in the Loving case, that history will show that uh, gay and lesbian people are good parents and that the world and that the sky will not fall. Let's open it up. I'll turn it to you to moderate. Thank you. We have 10 minutes for questions, and um, we do have a quick announcement. Speaking of Above the Law, we have been tweeted about by the Above the Law Twitter account. And they are, what do they say, Dave? Retweeted. They, will get a story. Uh, they just retweeted that they may be get doing a story on our debate today. So that's interesting. Um, we will be sure to let you know if that ever happens. So who has a question? Maybe a student? You're, you're going to monitor? Uh, sir. Um, Dr. Morris, I, I heard in the beginning of your argument you said that um, no fault separations, uh, the, the massive amount of fog that occurred from that. And I was wondering if you could go in a little bit too, because we recently heard in crim law, uh, one of the things that came from like no fault separations was unilateral separations, which then prevented wife rape. And I'm wondering like how you could think something like no fault separations could have such a negative impact when it could have such positive impacts in defining the rights of individuals. Uh, okay, I would, first of all, uh, 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 Spouse abuse was always a grounds, was always a grounds for a divorce. And, and, and in other words, you, you, that's not abuse. I mean, remember, consensuality okay, okay. was considered. You know, okay, but, but look at okay. So let's, so let's let's uh, let's posit that that's the case. Okay, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I'm, I'm not. I understand. I'm not a law person, so I'm not exactly right. sure what I'm stipulating here. So I'm being. I, I'm, but, I'm, I'm, I'm a first year law student. I don't even know. Okay. Well, maybe he's not a law person that. either. Okay. okay. So, so look at look, look at the point is this um, that that there was always provision in the law to deal with abusive situations, and I'm going to just put it that way. Okay. And if the issue is abusive situations, then of course you want to be able to deal with that. Okay. What I want to say to you is that what we have created with no fault is unilateral divorce where there isn't high conflict, right? And, and, and the biggest impact of, of unilateral divorce, no-fault divorce, you're quite right to use that term, by the way, unilateral divorce. Most divorces in America do not involve a, 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 any kind of abuse or violence, and most of them are unilateral, which means somebody leaves because they don't want to. So the real innovation that no-fault divorce made possible was how we treat the low-conflict marriage. Because the high conflict marriage, we always had tools for dealing with it. They might, you can argue they weren't our adequate tools. But you can deal with a high conflict marriage without saying that even a low conflict marriage, you get to walk away for any reason or no reason. And if you look at the data on how children fare, okay, and you ask the question, well, how do, how do children fare when their parents divorce? If there's a high conflict type of situation, um, children do better if their parents separate. Okay, there's no doubt about that. They do better if their parents separate. But if you look at a low conflict situation and the parents separate, those are the cases where the kids fall apart. They, they see that as an unwelcome intrusion to their lives and their, their lives really are made worse by that. And so the point is that, that probably, you know, a large, 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 vast majority of uh, those kinds of divorces, and in fact, the real innovation is what I'm trying to say, the real innovation in no fault divorce was in how we treated the low conflict marriage not in how we treated the high conflict marriage. That's the issue. And, so, and, so, and, and that's the part of it that has had so many um, far-reaching ramifications. 
uh, that, uh, that, that I think were not really thought through at the time. That's the point. Thank you. Mr. Katine, would you have a comment? Or should we take the next no, question? No, let's go to the next question. Another question? Yes, sir? <clears throat> okay, this is for Dr. Morris. Do you believe homosexuality is a choice? If so, do you have any evidence from peer-reviewed scientific journals? And if not, is it fair to exclude someone because of a characteristic they can't change? Um, I think that uh, the, que the question, you've obviously you've asked multiple questions here, okay? And so, um, first of all, the definition of homosexuality <coughs> takes is, uh, there are a number of forms to answers to that question. When sometimes when people are studying it, they're looking at same-sex sexual behavior, sometimes they're looking at attraction, sometimes they're looking at thoughts and fantasies, okay? And so when people are actually studying the question, I think it's important to realize that there's kind of a, a complex of things that are involved. And as far as I understand the scientific literature at this time, no one really knows why some people become homo have same-sex attraction and some people do not. No one really knows why a particular person has it. Uh, but I do, think we, I do think that the scientific literature shows that sexual orientation in general is more fluid in women than it is in men. So that there's something different going on. And I think most of the people who study this area do not particularly expect that they're going to find a unified field theory you know, that explains why men have it and why women have it, why everybody has it. I don't think anybody really expects that kind of an outcome. So, so you know, is, is it a choice? I, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's a choice, but I would throw the question back to you. If we don't even have a, an exact legal definition, if we don't have a scientific definition of what we're talking about, if there is fluidity in this concept, how are we going to create a legal category around it? And that seems to me, I, you know, like I said, I'm not a lawyer, but that seems like a problem if we're going to assert that it's something comparable <coughs> to race, and yet it has these kind of fuzzy edges around it. So, um, I'd like to comment real quick because I hear this all, all the time. I, I concur that we may not have definitive information, but I want to take the position of, so what if it's a choice? I happen to be Jewish. That's a choice. And I have rights as a Jewish person to the same rights and liberties and everything else that other people have. So I don't know whether it is uh, homosexuality is a choice or not, but I, I say it doesn't really matter in this country. One more question? Yes, sir. I have a question. You based your idea of marriage so much on the idea of procreation. And me being in a heterosexual marriage and with no intention of having kids anytime soon, should I be more fear of your interpretation of marriage than a couple who loves each other and wants to have kids or not? Well, um, I, I, I'm glad you brought up the question of procreation because it gives me a chance to respond to something he said that I wouldn't have gotten a chance to respond to otherwise. <laughs> um, and that is, um, you know, I never said that procreation was a requirement of marriage. That was kind of a little twist that you put on what I said, okay? That's not exactly what I said. It's not that every single couple has to procreate. What I said is that absent procreation and the needs it creates, you wouldn't need an institution of procreation. So let me turn around and put it to you this way. If every married couple had no intention of having any children, um, why would we be having marriage? Why would we be privileging those relationships? You know, and the answer is no one would care anymore, right? It would be like a friendship. Right, so why would we ever have just you know a government registry of friendships and, and privilege some of the friendships over other friendships? We wouldn't do that, you know. Um, and so the the fact that there are some people who are infertile or some people who are old. I mean, actually, every I don't know if you've noticed this, but every heterosexual couple eventually becomes sterile, right? Because we get old, you know what I mean? And that doesn't invalidate the marriage. Right? So so the, the, the procreation <coughs> argument works a little bit differently, I think, than uh, than the, the two of you have. Um, we're after, we have actually to wrap just, it up. I just yeah. want to respond in, in for one moment. I, I want to say that um, that having children as, as part of a marital situation, that there is a component there, in my opinion, that obviously my children who live in a society where, where people get married and they know what that means and they see it on TV, that, that it does provide two things, stability and a little more difficult to break up. And so I think my children would like uh, that that does provide. I, I disagree with the proposition that marriage doesn't provide at least some sense of permanency. Of course, we know it's not permanent, but it provides another <coughs> level of permanency to help people stay together during the difficult times. I think I'll stop there. Well, thank you both very much for coming.